And that's the, the title of this conference this year. It's called Being Mutually Encouraged. And it comes from the passage in Romans chapter 1, verse 12. Let me read that, and then we'll get right into the word of the Lord. Romans 1, 12 says, That is, that we might be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Let me pray for us and ask God to bless both the teaching and the hearing of the word. Father, we ask you to come and speak life into this message and life into the hearer, that we might be not just hearing about being encouraged, but even this message would encourage us. And we give thanks for that. This conference would encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul is speaking here about a need he has in his own life, not just a need to encourage others that you will see that he has, but also a need to be encouraged. What's the context of this need that we find Paul in at the situation? We find him at a situation very much like America in our generation. If you look at a little bit later in this chapter, we read verse 12, but if you go on and look at some of the other verses, verse 24, speaking about them exchanging the glory of God for creation and for, for truth for a lie, speaking of that, Paul's understanding of the spiritual, emotional, uh, cultural condition of his day was that therefore, verse 24, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their heart to impurity, dishonoring their bodies among themselves. He goes on to a second time saying the same phrase, but this time it's actually even a deeper penetration into the ways of wickedness, of evil, of a culture gone astray. And he says, verse 26, Therefore, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations, and they were consumed with passion for one another. Does this seem familiar to you? Does this seem like the culture we're living in today? Do we see even be the hierarchy of political leadership down to the educational systems, even in kindergarten and first grade, of, of, of people seeing this? And, and what is the reward of this that they get, are given over? Uh, God gave them up to their passions. Well, Paul goes on to one more thing. These, this is a, a sort of a declension scale. It's, it's, a, it's a sliding down into uh, more depravity. And we see here and then in verse 28, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up to a debased mind. This is the mind that now can no longer think clearly. This is the mind that calls good evil and evil good. And so this is the culture. I don't want to take too much time in some of the difficulties that Paul's facing, nor too much time in the difficulties we're facing. But we are in a situation very similar that Paul found himself in. And that's the context from which he's preaching this message about mutual encouragement. It is in times like that, it's in seasons like that, it's in situations like that where we need the church of Jesus Christ, where we need the leadership of, the, of those in the church and in ministry, that we need each other in the body of Christ to rise up and say, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what's happening in culture, no matter what you see in the news, we can stand for one another, stand with one another, rise up and mutually encourage one another in the gospel, continue to encourage one another to be holy in the midst of a crooked generation, to be truthful in a situation saturated by the lies of the, of the wicked one, encourage one another to stand in the word when the word is being compromised or forgotten. These are some of the ways that we can encourage one another. Paul, first of all, has himself uh, he, if you look at the earlier part of the chapter, you see him there talking about his faith, his calling, his mission. And out of that, what he's doing, he's already encouraging those he's writing to, saying, in the midst of a crooked generation, I want you to know there's a brother out here, but the brother named Paul, who no matter what's happened around me, I'm not going to compromise. No matter what happens around me, I'm going to stand for the truth, believe the truth, walk in the truth. No matter how difficult the world seems to be. I'm not going to be a man who's going to get discouraged, who's going to give up, who's going to surrender. And we see that in pastoral ministry today. We see that in, in mission ministry today. We see that in nonprofit Christian organizations today. So many leaders getting discouraged, getting weary because of the cultural bombardment of the wickedness around them. And oftentimes the lack of encouragement within the body of Christ. So many leaders are leaving the ministry because they say, I feel like I'm standing alone. I feel like I don't have any help. I experienced this in my own life, in my own ministry, when uh, I was going through a very, probably the most difficult time as a pastor in the church that I was pastoring. And some people in the church sort of got in their, uh, got in their mind to, to come against me and my family and began to tell lies about us and began to accuse us falsely and began to raise up leaders against us to try to, to derail our, our ministry. And I remember in the middle of all that, I had two close friends and, and I called one and he was so helpful. 
he just talked me through this. He just listened. He encouraged me. And then I had another friend I hadn't talked to in a long time. He lives on the East Coast. And I called him. And I, I, I cannot believe what he said. He said, uh, give, me, give me a day. Uh, I'll, I'll book my flight today and I'll be out there tomorrow. So he flew from the East Coast to where I live in Colorado. And he spent three or four days with me. And he encouraged me and prayed over me. And he blessed me. But the, mo- the thing he did most importantly was he listened. And it's important for you, leader, to have somebody in your life not just for you to listen to them as a camp pastor, camp pastoral counselor, or as a ministry counselor, or as a teen challenge counselor, having you be in the position of helping somebody else, but sometimes you and I are in the position of needing somebody to help us. And one of the great ways to, to do that for others or to have that in your own life is to have somebody that'll listen to you. Christian counselors say there's this thing called regulation and deregulation. I don't know if you ever heard of that before or not. Um, but they, and they talk about it on a scale of one to 10. And, and one is being, you are very dis- deregulated. You're, you're off your game. You're not in that place of encouragement or joy or lo- abundant life that Bible promises. And, and, and a, a four to five, follow me on this, a four to five is being regulated the way the, the scripture talks about. There's peace, uh, having that renewed mind, walking in the joy of the Lord. That's that sweet spot of the four or five. But if you get under that, like a three or a two or a one, that's being deregulated in a way that is, if you, talk, if you remember the, the talking about fight or flight, this would be the flight that you, you, just, you just close in like a turtle in a shell. You, just, you want to shut down the, the pain of life, the struggles of life, the difficulties of life, get you to a place where you can't think straight. You just sort of check out. You just don't have hope anymore. You feel depressed, discouraged, downcast, ready to give up. Now, the other way, being deregulated is on the high end of that. If you're at a 7, 8, and 9, and 10, what you are is you're fighting, then you're angry, you're frustrated, you're, you're bitter, you're, you're antagonistic, you're uh, aggressive, you're always, uh, you're, you're grumpy, you just, you have a bad attitude. Well, both of those are levels, whether it goes too low and you get depressed or too high and you get aggressive, is, is missing the, this word regulation that God has. It's not a scriptural word. But it's, it's a word that could be matched by many biblical principles about joy, about abundant life, about peace that passes understanding. That's that sweet spot of the, what we would call the four or the five. Now, what do you do when you get in that deregulation? Do you just sort of grit your teeth and say, okay, I won't be depressed? Or do you say, okay, I won't get aggressive. I'll just, I'll, I'll try to calm down. I'll breathe. Is that what you do? No. You know what, you know what these Christian counselors tell us? That, this is so interesting. When you get around a person who is regulated, who is in that that place of peace, that sweet spot, where they're walking in joy, where they're walking in the rest and the confidence in the Lord. Just by being around that person and them listening to you, them them hearing you say, I feel agitated, I feel angry, or or, man, I I just want to quit. Just them listening to you will, they've actually done this in neuroscience. They've checked brain scans of people that have somebody to listen to them and just the fact that somebody's listening to them, all of a sudden, if they're aggressive and antagonistic, all of a sudden that comes down and they start to breathe and feel better. Or if they're depressed and ready to give up, they start feeling a little bit of hope and confidence. You know, it's a joy to be a part of this Teen Challenge Pastors Conference. And one of the great joys is that I get to spend time with, with Brother Ron Brown, who is <laughs> probably one of the best, I don't think anybody's ever said this to him before, but he's probably one of the best regulators you'd ever meet. Um, you, you can be... You can be overwhelmed and, and frustrated and maybe angry at people, and he'll just listen to you and share a scripture, and all of a sudden you just go like, okay, you know, that anger seems to be dissipating. Thank you for, thank you for listening, and, and, and that word you gave me was good. Or you could feel like giving up. See, that's, that's, that's what Paul's talking about here when he says, you know, I, I can't wait to come to you. I've tried to come to you before, but now I want to come to you because I, I want to help you get in that place of of. Uh, Paul doesn't call it regulated. He calls it encouraged, a place where you're encouraged. If you're encouraged, you're not going to be angry or frustrated or bitter. If you're encouraged, you're not going to be depressed or discouraged and ready to give up. You're going to be in that place of, of encouragement where you know what your giftings are. You know what your calling is. You know what your, your, your heart's passion is. And you're ready to just d- jump into that without these two deregulating elements that Satan brings into our life. So let's talk a little more practically. What does Paul do when he says, I want to be there with you uh, so that we can be mutually encouraged? There are several things we want to see here about this. And the first thing I would suggest to you is that Paul uses the the phraseology mutually encouraged. 
Some of us as leaders feel like it's up to us. We're the superheroes. We're the ones with the content and the character and the Holy Ghost anointing. And everywhere we go, we have to be the ones to give. Now, Paul knew that he had things to give. He said, I'm going to come to you in this chapter, a few verses earlier, the 14th verse. He says, I'm going to come to you and I want to impart some spiritual gift to you. And he's not talking here about, I'm going to lay hands on you and you're going to be an evangelist. or I'm going to lay hands on you and you're going to be an apostle. uh, Because those gifts come from the Holy Spirit. The impartation he wants to give is an impartation of the spiritual gift of encouragement, of standing strong, of being faithful in an hour of uh, cultural demise and moral decay, uh, that you can stand uh, in a holy life in the middle of all that. And so he he says, I want to come and encourage you, but I I love the wisdom of Paul. He says, but you know what? I need you to encourage me as well. A lot of leaders only have the one form of encouragement. I'm here to encourage you. I'm always strong. I'm always up. I'm always giving. I'm always the hero in the story. But sometimes we need to be the person that says, for this moment, I need to be served. I need to be listened to. I need to be comforted. I need to be encouraged as well. And this is that mutual encouragement. And many Christian leaders, kingdom leaders, pastors, and ministry leaders find themselves always encouraging others, but never being encouraged themselves. Never maybe even having somebody in their life that is a regulator that can help them get into that spot of encouragement in their life. Let me give you a direct word of encouragement here today. Find someone in your life that not only you are there to encourage them, but they are an encouragement to you. If you're a pastor, it could be an elder in your church. It could be another pastor in your city that maybe isn't facing the same day in and day out problems of your local church and so that he can hear you without necessarily having to judge what's going on in the body, just there to be there for, just to be there for you. So Paul is saying this is a mutual thing we're doing. We're encouraging one another. We're helping one another regulate. We're helping one another get to that place of encouragement and joy and being strengthened. How does Paul do this? And how does he suggest we do this? Well, he actually gives us some interesting truths here. And as a, a Bible teacher, I like this because Paul made it easy to give a four-point sermon here or a three-point sermon. He, he uses all these words that start with the letter S. And so let's just talk about these real briefly here. Uh, in verse 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. So this first word is serve. So when Paul is talking about mutual encouragement, part of that has to do with serving. Not just being served, but serving others, giving away. You see, the opposite of the leader who is always giving, giving, giving is the, is the leader who's giving, 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 but has a, a, a different agenda. I'm giving to you so that you could build my ministry. I want to I wanna build you up so that you could take this role and therefore enhance the work that I'm doing. It's, it's a self-kingdom building service rather than Paul saying, I serve in the spirit. This is a spiritual service. I'm serving the Holy Spirit. I'm serving God, not man, not myself, not serving my own cause, my own kingdom building mentality. So this is pure service. And that's where Paul starts when he says, if we're going to mutually encourage one another, it has to be a spirit of mutual service towards one another. The second thing we see here is in verse 10, or let's read the verse, last verse 9, uh, that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. So the second S here is supplication. Serving, the first way to serve then, is through supplication, through praying for one another. I like what Paul says here. I, I, I mention you daily in my prayers. Uh, for me, that's encouraging because I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of coworkers. I have a lot of people on my staff. And for me to spend 10, 15 minutes praying for each of those, I would have no other ministry except praying for them. This is interesting what Paul says. I, I, just, I, I just mentioned you in prayer. I don't have to take in a half an hour. I don't have to spend all day. I, I just every day, But every day, though, I mention you. I, I, I call on your name. Lord, I pray for my wife, Kelly. I pray for my son, David. I pray for my, my, my friend, Paul. I pray, just, just mentioning their names is, is something that brings a, an encouragement in the spirit. Knowing that you're being prayed for, one, but also the work of the Holy Spirit released when you mention that person's name in prayer. Now, if you have time, you want to certainly go on and pray, maybe in more depth, pray with some wisdom about certain situations in their life. But this attitude of serving through supplication is key to what Paul is encouraging us to do. The third thing we see there is is in verse 11. For I long to see you. Now, I love this that we're doing this on video. In this time of pandemic, we're forced to do something like this. And a lot of churches are enjoying it. They're going 
virtual, online, they're, that they're spending more time, energy, and money uh, on their online services than their, than their actual face-to-face -face service. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad we can do what we can do when we're in trouble. But you know what? Uh, I'm going to give you just my opinion, my heart. I'd much rather see somebody. I love seeing these two cameras in front of me here today. I love that you can hear my message. But it's different because I don't see you. And Paul, Paul feels that difference. He could write him letters. He could send Timothy to give him a report. But you know what, his heart, it's almost like I picture him with tears in his eyes saying, oh man, there's, just, there's a groaning in my heart. I want to see you. There's something about face-to-face -face ministry. There's something about, again, it goes back to this thing of regulation. It's, I, I can watch a video and it really won't regulate me, so to speak, like it would be if I call, again, Brother Ron Brown. It's, it's, there's something different about being with somebody, being present mutually, not just listening to an online video. And again, please don't shut this off now because you hear me kind of talking bad about videos. I'm not talking bad about videos. They're so important. But there's something that is more important, that face-to-face, -face, that presence. Sometimes somebody putting a hand on your shoulder and saying, let me just pray for you in the name of Jesus right now. And you feel that, that presence, that impartation that Paul told me, I, I, I want to come to you because I want to impart something to you. That word impart has something to do with like the laying on of hands of the presence that we have with one another. You see, we have the presence of God with us at all times, but you know, we need, sometimes we need something else. I'm gonna say something that shock, is gonna shock you right now. I, I have said for almost all my ministry that I don't need anything but Jesus. All I need is God, and I wasn't telling the truth. God didn't create me just to need him alone. He created me to need other people as well. He, Adam and Eve, when Adam was standing alone, he, he, uh, he could have said, you know, hey, I'm satisfied. I, you know, it's like I don't have anybody to take care of. I'm, I'm freelancing it here. Uh, but he, he didn't do that. God looked at him and said, it's not good that you are alone. He, he needed some other people in his life. He needed someone to stand with him. He needed somebody to walk with him. And, and we need that in our life. We need the body. See, that's why we're called the body of Christ. It's Christ's presence, not just through the mystical union with him uh, uh, from the throne room of heaven, but in reality of people standing with us. So Paul is saying mutual encouragement is a seeing of one another. So it's serving through praying for one another and then seeing, spending time with each other in the, in the present. That I might impart some spiritual gift to you to strengthen you. So the last thing I would say about this idea of mutual encouragement <coughs> Excuse me. The last thing I would say about the idea of mutual encouragement is that we're there to strengthen one another, to build one another up. And the last few minutes I have with you, I just want to talk about this idea of strengthening one another because this culture that we're living in is not just sort of randomly happening to fall off a cliff of moral decay. It is orchestrated by the very powers of darkness itself. Satan, knowing that his time is short, is unleashing on the earth this great uh, moral battle. It's a cosmic battle. It's, it's in a spiritual battle. You may not know it or not, but the idea of mutual encouragement is not just some sort of like, I hope you feel a little bit better today because I was with you, or I, I gave you a Bible verse and now you, you feel a little bit more peppy. No, this is life and death stuff. The mutual encouragement that the gospel speaks about here is meant to, to counter the cosmic battle of satanic attack that's in the world today, that's upon the church today. It's certainly his work is in the moral decay of society, uh, and that's what he does. But you know where he really likes to attack is where there's goodness, where there's joy, where there's life, where there's freedom. That's why the snake was in the garden it wasn't outside the garden in the wilderness. It was in the garden. The snake always attacks in the garden. And, and Satan is there to attack your beauty. He's there, you know, some, some of us think that Satan attacks my weakness. Not, a, not at all. I mean, he, I'm, I'm sure he does that as well. But really what he's after is your goodness, your strength, your power, your, your wisdom, your glory. I would suggest to you, find the area in your life where you're under attack and don't feel weak or ready to give up in that area, but realize Satan is attacking the greatest glory and strength that you have. You say, Pastor Gary, are you saying I have glory? Absolutely. C.S. Lewis says this well when he says, if you could look at a man the way God sees him, you would fall down on your face. Not to worship him, but just be mesmerized. You'd be overwhelmed at the beauty and the power and the love and the goodness and the graciousness that God implants upon a child of his own. It's in his image. And that image was marred, but now that marring is take, take, to, taken away and there's a restoration of the fullness of God's image. So you have a glory, but Satan is there to attack your glory. How does he do that? 
I believe that his number one power that he uses against to keep us from being mutually encouraged is accusations. He's always accusing the brethren. He is, the name of the devil itself, or Lucifer, is, is the accuser. And so he is out there. Uh, I, I, would, I would be totally shocked if, every, if not every single person who's listened to me is accused by the devil every single day. I would even suggest, I don't think I'd be too far off to say, it's probably 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 times a day, Satan is putting something in your mind, saying you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not worthy enough, you'll never make it, you should just give up, you're not smart enough, you're, you're and it could be even something that, that, that he accused you in your childhood. Like, you know, uh, I'll just give you a personal example. When I was in, I think, sixth grade, somebody told me, man, you have a big nose. And, and even today, you know, I'm 60 plus years old. Sometimes I look in the mirror and I go like, man, that nose is big. He was right. And so, so just it could be a physical accusation. I, I, I weigh too much or I've lost my hair or, uh, you know, the, my, my, I walk crooked. It's, it's physical. It's spiritual. It's emotional. It's relational. It's, it's like when you walk into a room and there's a group of people around you. Uh, you feel like, I don't belong. You, you hear that voice. Those are accusations. Now, the accusations are not going to stop till Jesus comes. But here's what can stop the agreements with the accusations. When the Satan attacks you, uh, he's going to do that. If you can rebuke that, if you can stand against it, great. And if somebody can mutually encourage you, come alongside of you and say, don't listen to that lie. That's not truth. Then you can be set free from that. But the, the, the accusations will come. The key to you and me is, are we going to agree with that or not? So you hear this voice, the enemy saying to you, um, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. Your, your nose is too big. You hear these lies, and, and all of a sudden you go, yeah, I, I agree with that. I am. I, I am. Uh, I'm slow of speech, like Moses said. I stutter. I, you know, and you're agreeing with these lies. Now you say, well, some of these things are true. Well, they may be true, but they are not debilitating in the sense that God can't still use you. You know, so, so, so maybe you have this thing. Maybe you have some fear in your life and Satan's attacking you. saying you're always so afraid. But if you agree with that, then you're going to give into that and it's going to keep you from moving into the realm of power, of authority, of the things that God has for you. And so we need to break these agreements where the flesh, our own self, our own voice, where the enemy, the Satan himself, the accuser, where the world around us, the broken, fallen world, is telling us who we are, trying to, to create our image, our personality, break free from that by breaking the agreements. How do you break these agreements? Well, I would turn to, I don't have time to go into it in depth, but I would turn to Revelation chapter 12, where, where we see in the last days, in this cosmic battle that I'm talking about between Satan and the, the kingdom of God, in this cosmic battle we see Revelation 12, the Bible describes, uh, they overcame them, they overcame these accusations. They broke these agreements. And then, they, and then they were encouraged that who they, they knew who they were in Christ. They knew their giftedness. They knew they were full of glory. The glory of God was in them. They knew their potential. They knew their power. They knew their authority. And so this, this thing of overcoming them, how was it? It was said, number one, by the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that uh, I remember as a young pastor, uh, the churches that I used to be a part of, they, they used the phrase, I don't hear it too often anymore, but it was called pleading the blood. Have you ever heard that before? Pleading the blood of the lamb. Just, I plead the blood over Jesus. In other words, you're, 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 you're almost begging, Lord, cover this thing with the blood of the lamb. You remember children of Israel, when the angel of death was coming over, they put the, the hyssop with, with blood over their doorpost and the angel of death would pass by. It's the blood of the lamb that covers over accusations. It's like Satan just uh, sees something that, that he can't get into anymore. Jesus had this himself. He says, Satan has come to me, and he found no place in me at all. Isn't that amazing? No place in him at all. And you and I, we have places. The accusation comes, we start agreeing with it. But that can be broken by this precious blood. That's, that's part of the reason it's called precious blood of the Lamb, because how precious it is to cover these accusations, how precious it is to, to break these agreements. So number one is the blood of the Lamb. Number two is, is by the word of their testimony. Isn't that amazing? So you're agree you, you get accused, you make an agreement with the accuser, and then all of a sudden you're starting to verbalize that. Yeah, I am worthless. Yeah, I am no good. Yeah, I'm not strong enough. Yeah, I don't read my Bible very much. Yeah, I don't pray very much. Yeah, my sermons go on too long and things start beeping. But no matter what goes on in your life, these accusations can be broken. These agreements can be broken by this authority. 
You have authority in the blood of the Lamb. That blood, Hebrews says, speaks a better word. Isn't that powerful? It speaks a better word than the accusations. The accusations say this about you. Uh, it's like the old song says, whose report do you believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. And that's my testimony. I believe that God gave me authority to stomp on the head of the devil. I believe God authority gave me authority to cover all my sin. I believe God, the precious blood of Jesus has broken all these lies that, that caused me to not reach up to the heights, to the potential, to the giftedness, to the calling that God has for me. And then it, lastly it says, and they were willing to, they didn't live their life for themselves. They were willing to lay down their life for the gospel. In other words, this is saying that if you're going to break these accusations and you're going to break these lies and these agreements and you're going to have the blood of the Lamb speak a better word over you, then you're going to have to come to this place of not wanting it just for yourself, but a mutual encouragement, doing this not just for myself, but now I'm going out to mutually encourage other people that the blood of the Lamb can cover your life, can cover your family, can cover all these situations that are going on that are hardships for you. You can be covered by the pleading the blood of the lamb over your life. You can plead the blood of the lamb over your children. I do this. I have four children, and all four of them, at some point in our history as a family, have, have, have suffered some difficulties, difficulties in their marriage, difficulties, uh, some of them even with addictions. And what my wife and I did is just, just stood on this Revelation chapter 12. We're going to plead the blood of Jesus over them. Our testimony is that our children are going to be set free, and we're going to lay down our lives for them. We're going to lay down our lives to believe that the, the gospel is strong enough. There's a, there's a, and that, that moves you from the accusation to the authority, that you're standing as a Christian who has authority now. I, I can break these lies. I can break these accusations. I can break these chains. This is what Isaiah 61 says, that Jesus came to break the chains. Uh, of, of bondage, to heal those who are brokenhearted, to comfort those who are mourned. And then he's given you and I authority. If you remember, and I'll close with this, if you remember, Jesus sent out the 12 and he says, I'm going to give you power, authority. And what this power and authority is going to be is you can heal the sick, you can preach the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, and you can cast out demons. You can confront these accusations, these lies. It was a spiritual authority over dominions of darkness that they had. Then later on, he sends out the 72, and he gives them the same command, preach the gospel, heal the sick, and, and cast out demons. And if you remember, they come back to Jesus, and they don't say, we preached the gospel, and we did such a great job. There's multitudes of people there. And he doesn't say, we healed the sick. There was a person in a wheelchair, and they stood up, and they walked. You know what they said? They came back, and they said, our hearts were filled with joy because even the demons uh, uh, just we're under our beck and our call, we had authority over the powers of darkness. That's what they were rejoicing. And Jesus' response was, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You see, Jesus has all authority and power on earth. And on the cross, particularly, he, he nailed all those accusations that you and I hear. He nailed them to the cross. And we only believe them if we believe the, the lies that they're still in existence. But not only does Jesus have authority over Satan, now he says to his, to his 12, to his 72, and to you and I, you have authority. And your authority is in pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over these accusations and lies in your life, your family, your church, your ministry, your health, your emotions, every area of your life and your relationships. And then you have authority that, and you have authority when you're coming to somebody else who's deregulated and they're hurting and they're wounded or they're aggressive, or they're angry, you have authority in your life to plead in that supplication, to plead the blood of Jesus over them, to speak a better word into their life, to give a testimony and to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters so that the gospel could be powerful in their life as well. I hope these, this message and these that you'll hear during this 10th anniversary conference will encourage you to take the authority that God has given you. So let me pray for you, and I ask you to pray for Teen Challenge as well while we're praying. Father, we do, I do take a moment just to pray for Southern California Teen Challenge, that you continue to bless them, continue as they are growing, reaching out, Antelope Valley and other new areas, that they, they, their, their ministry is spreading and expanding. And that's always, uh, that's never without being contested and contended with by the devil. And so we need to pray over them. We pray over them in the name of Jesus right now that, that any lie, accusation, devious plan, would be, would be just covered by the blood of Jesus. And any agreement with that, saying like, that's not gonna happen or we're not gonna get through this, we, we, we just break that by our testimony as well, that the blood speaks a better word over Teen Challenge. And we thank you, Lord, for such a supply 
That's another S here that you supply all of our needs, all of this ministry's needs according to your riches and glory. We give you thanks for this. And now I pray for those listening right now in Jesus' name, God. We thank you that, that when they're discouraged, they have authority. And when they see somebody else who's in crisis, they have authority in this things we're talking about today by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, by their laying down of their life. We thank you, God. Send us encouragers and give us the power to stand strong in encouragement, even in a wicked generation. We give thanks for all these things, for, for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thanks for letting me be with you here.